That's the Mingus Big Band with Monin. Does that not communicate it so effectively? Just craziness happening. That was written, of course, by Charles Mingus, featuring Ronnie Cuber on baritone sax. I could listen to him play that every day, every day. It's so one of my favorite instruments to, to appreciate. This is from the album Nostalgia in Times Square from 1993. This is Lead Stories. I'm Beatrice Lead, and uh, we're going to talk about two things today. Hoping, of course, that you have some ideas and opinions and analysis to share. The first is about Venezuela. We come back to Venezuela because there are developments there. And we're hearing uh, that Maduro is being encouraged to hold talks. And it seems as if he is uh, not dismissing that idea. But mind you, he is under serious pressure. So uh, the first topic would be to answer the question or to address the question, can Venezuela's embattled president, Nicolas Maduro, even with Russia and China and Turkey at his side, holding his back, hold out much longer against the mounting pressure by the United States and its allies to remove him from office? That's the question. Can, can Maduro hold out, or how long can he hold out, or what do you expect would have to happen if he is to hold out? That's the question. We know that Russia and China, and Turkey, and a few other countries uh, are backing him uh, as he deals with popular uprising throughout the country. And we have the international community, many countries in the international community are taking the other side. As uh, uh, Mike Pompeo, the ambassador to the UN had said, now is the time for people to pick sides. Well, I thought there was just one side myself. It may not be perfect. And that, to me, is for the people to decide, not foreign countries. You don't get in there unless, of course, there's such a dire situation. But you don't interfere in... The, the sovereign affair, affairs of nations. You leave that alone. And there will come a time when it, you know, if your participation is needed or indicated, then that's fine. And even so, it would be done in concert with uh, people and in consultation with people from the country. It's, it's no uh, question that Venezuela has a crisis on its hands, but it did not manufacture this price crisis. The, the government did not manufacture this crisis, even though people would be inclined to say so. Uh, but it did come about as a result of many things having to do in part, in large measure, with the pressure applied from outside. Uh, when we had uh, a, a situation where the people could do something if that's what they chose to do, that was discouraged because that kind of sounded a bit like a democratic situation. <laughs> they don't want democratic situations here at all. They want this man gone for all kinds of reasons. But this country, which has the world's largest reserves of oil, is of keen interest to many parties for many reasons. And so the struggle continues, the struggle 
over power continues and we don't know where it is going to end up. But for the meantime, the latest is that uh, the, the, the idea is being floated. I don't know who exactly floated the idea, but even Maduro's backers, and specifically that's China and Russia, are saying, in effect, why not explore this uh, alternative to total oblivion? Why not just take it, uh, take it into consideration and see where it goes? The idea of entering into talks and therefore, quote, negotiations with the very people trying to put your lights out. So we'll see how that goes. So that's the question on the floor at the moment. Can Venezuela's embattled uh, President Nicolas Maduro, even with support from Russia and China and Turkey, can he hold out much longer against mounting pressure by the United States and its allies to remove him from office? 888-874-4888. Let's get into it. What are you thinking? What is likely to happen now? Will we see a good faith effort? It's hard to have a good faith effort when soldiers are being stationed at your border and people are being armed and there's a concerted effort uh, both within and outside the country to basically get you out. Even though you were elected, even though the presumption is that it was a democratic process, and even if people disagree, this is the whole point, even if people disagree and don't like him and want him out, there is a process. This is not it. There is a process by which you can uh, explore that as part of the constitution of the country, how to remove a president. We would not like it, we would not appreciate it here in the United States as much as we dislike Donald Trump, that in the morning we see a bunch of tanks rolling up uh, to the White House and, uh, you know, ordering him to get out. That, that is not the way it is done. That is not the way it's supposed to be done. So let's hear what you think. We start with Donald from Georgia. Hello, Donald. Yeah, who tell you, Chief? Look, look, I, Thank I you. like to ask, ask the question first before I give my answer. What, what are they accusing Maduro of? Corruption. They're accusing him of being uh, incompetent. And they're accusing his his entire administration of just being corrupt. Okay. Now, now did they they're, go also, by the way, I should add that they're accusing him because he just recently was elected. They're accusing him of rigging that election. Okay. And I know that Jimmy Carter was over there and he said it was a, a straight up election. But saying, in saying this, should I think Maduro... Uh, have discussions with his opponents. I don't. I don't think it would matter. His opponent has one thing in mind. He figures that Maduro is on the ropes. He wants to go and take him out and fulfill his job that he's supposed to do for the United States. I think the United States wants that oil. They're not interested in talking, really. Whatever whatever he says, they they gonna make something out of it to their to their advantage. So I think I think he should stand tall as uh, as long as he can. That's what I think. Well, if if he follows your advice, it means that it's a it's a foregone conclusion that his enemies or the people who are looking for him to leave office by every means necessary would have won. Well, I'm I'm not he, you know. He can talk with them, but at the same time, behind the scenes while he's talking, I think they should be plotting a strategy. 
I think I think I think you United States figure they have won anyway. If he breaks down to talk to them, United States say, Okay, we got him. We got him. They they, they will see that as a part of weakness. Like I said, the United States has an empire attitude. What it wants, it's going to get. And I think, too, the United States wants to prove to Russia and China, I'm the top dog. So, you know, he can talk, but he should be plotting something while he's talking. I noticed that, uh, well, it was reported on my Facebook page that Russia sent two two planes over to Venezuela uh, I, the day before yesterday or yesterday that has nuclear capabilities. So th- th- they're preparing for war. They're preparing for war. Is it, in your view, inevitable that there will be a war? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, because it's, this is something that goes beyond Venezuela. Venezuela is something like a proxy. You know, China, China needs that oil as well. And China is beginning to flex her muscles. Russia, Russia wants to be a big dog on the international scene again, just like the United Soviet Socialists. So, so, you know, it's the but game. they have. They also have another issue, which is that they are very uh, fully invested in the economy of Venezuela. They have extended so many billions of dollars in loans to Venezuela. Uh, right. So. How does that, in your view, mitigate the the effort that they're making now to stand by uh, uh, by the president? By Maduro? Maduro? Yes. It makes them stand stronger. As I said, they, they got too much invested. Plus, the United States is not going to stop with Venezuela. The next is Nicaragua. And who tell them might, it might even, might even be Cuba? You're looking at a, a Vietnam prank situation there. That's what you're looking at. Wow. Okay. Well, that's a very sober analysis. Thank you very much, Donald, for calling in and contributing today. Tony Orlan- Tony from Orlando, you're on the, the air. Hi, Trees. Hello. Um, I think uh, Maduro's days are, are numbered. Uh, today, there was a report where the uh, the Russians sent in a, an airplane to pretty much take all the gold out of Venezuela. So as far as their debt's concerned, it seems like their debt's been covered. So I think Maduro is preparing for the time when he has to step down. Now, I think it's going to happen at the hands of his own military. He's, uh, unfortunately, he's, he's no Chavez. See, Chavez was a military man. He had uh, full... Uh, faith uh, in the military, but Maduro unfortunately is going to be betrayed by his own military. You think so? Yes. Well, we have had one of his top uh, military aides actually uh, flip and uh, publicly did so. So yes, you may you may be right here, but if if indeed that is the case, then what's next? The the uh, opposition right now is, is are they going to be interested in uh, people from the military who have flipped, uh, keeping them on, not uh, expecting that there will still continue to be protests and, and reactions against their action? Well, I think uh, pretty much it's going to be Maduro is going to step down, and there's going to be concessions made by the military and um, and the opposition, and pretty much it's going to be a uh, you know a, a U.S. Uh, puppet in place, business as usual in in the Americas. So, what does that say then about the genuineness of 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 the backing of Russia and China and Turkey, for example? As far as Russia and China and Turkey, um, see, the world economy basically is at the hands of the United States. Everything revolves around the U.S. dollar. That The U.S. dollar is uh, the monetary um, currency of the world. And the United States can make or break these countries. And 
you know, uh, I don't think they really have that much influence in this part of the region. So I think they're just going to try to, you know, recoup the most they can out of the situation. And that's why you're seeing that Maduro is willing to talk. Even so, it's not going to end. The situation is not going to end. Even if that occurred, it would still continue because there is enough uh, acrimony on both sides uh, to to feed it. Well, we're just going to have to wait and see. But it seems like Maduro is ready to uh, step out of the country. Oh, wow. Well, Tony, you may have... You may have good reason to say that. We'll see. Thank you so much for your call today. Ed from Queens, you're on the air. Yeah, good morning, Utrecht. How are you doing? Okay, Ed. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, good afternoon, Rav. I've been up pretty late, so I'm still in a little <laughs> bit of a time flux, so to speak. I had to work late last night. But uh, like I said yesterday, this is classic United States policy in Central and South America. And unfortunately, uh, I believe Maduro is going to is either going to be ousted in in the in the same way uh, that uh, the Haitian president was ousted, or the same way that Aristide. happened to Allende in Chile. Oh, Aristide, you were talking about? Yeah, Aristide. Excuse me. Yeah, Aristide. The name escaped me. I, I think this is going to be the same thing. I honestly believe that Chavez was killed, and. Uh, and we're not dealing with ideologies anymore. We're dealing in a world that is basically controlled by the invisible hand, as Adam Smith wrote in his books about the capitalism and, 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 uh, and the monetary control. We're not even dealing with communism. We're not even dealing with, with uh, political ideologies. We're dealing with money. There's a small group of people that control the resources in this world, and they've been growing in power ever since the days, as far as the United States is concerned, of the New Deal, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, of uh, the Brexit, all of these things, when looked at in context, exemplify the fact that uh, money and resources control the world. If political ideologies are falling, uh, the Soviet Union fell, uh, China's trying to become an economic power. So everybody's working hand in glove. Due to the fact it that does, there it, are, it, so ideology, as you say, as you see it, ideology is secondary to economic interest. Ideology is dead. I don't even think it's secondary anymore. I mean, political ideology and true, true, uh, true political thought and true systems of two different and diverse systems of government are gone because too much of okay, the wealth is concentrated so, in too little hands. So call it now. What happens now with this uh, idea of a rapprochement, with uh, you know, negotiations? Well, I, I what think it's a do red herring. You make of I think, this idea? I think it's a red herring. I mean, how can if if he doesn't have the sincere backing of Russia and China, how can he negotiate? I mean, they're setting him up. They're setting him up for either. Uh, ousting or removal or, or or murder. I mean, you know, you read the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman. This is how they do it. And unfortunately, until the calcification of of resources and, and, and capital is broken up by, I don't even know how. I mean, I'm, like I said, I deal a lot with education. I believe an informed, per, an informed populace is the best thing. I don't see how we're going to ever have any real resolution or foment because it's so easily suppressed by the calcification of capitalism. I mean, it needs to be done, but as far as the mechanisms, um, I'd have to do more research to give you an exact idea. But right now, as it stands, I think Maduro is screwed. So how, finally, how does this uh, position or reposition, if you think it does, China and Russia with regard to the historic ideological ties they have had in the region. Well, I think the and ideological the, ties. To I think the ideological ties are over. I think now people are concerned with positioning themselves. China and Russia, China especially, is concerned with positioning itself 
as an economic power, as economic power in the immediate future, in the next 10 or 15 years. They have a worldwide, what they call, the, I believe it's called the road, a worldwide trade uh, uh, network they're trying to set up. They, they're, going, they're going outside of the quote-unquote communist ideal and to be more capitalist. Everybody wants to set themselves, every nation wants to set themselves up for the next 20 to 50 years. They want to be economic power. They want to be in control. And China's doing that. They're doing it in Africa. They're, they're, they're cutting their losses. And they're making deals. Amos Wilson said it best. You don't have any allies. You just have convenient partners as far as what your, what, what your main goal is and concern. And that's how the world is becoming. Ideology and political theory is out the window. We're talking about money. We're talking about survival of the fittest and how best you can put your nation in the future as far as capital is concerned. And as long as that's Excellent. going on, the, the competition is going to get screwed. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ed for your Thank call you. today. Jose from Rosedale, you're on the air. How do you see this development? Greetings, my professor. Uh, as an old timer who has seen so much and has, has endured so much, my heart is very heavy laden. And uh, when I am looking at this, this scenario playing itself out in Venezuela, uh, I don't have a lot of hope. I, I, I keep hoping that we would have some sort of a strong opposition in this world to uh, uh, the forces of evil. And it, it is not there. I thought for one time that the, that the Russians and the Chinese who have been, developed themselves into a force to, 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 as a, as a, uh, uh, to combat the evil forces that has, uh, has been ravaging the world and robbing and plundering its resources. I, I see Mr. Maduro, uh, he's, uh, he's up against a whole lot. I don't know how strong the, the uh, support he'll be getting from the Russians or from the Chinese, because, you know, I've noticed throughout history that uh, uh, world leaders at times have a way of uh, making deals on the back of the oppressed. They will sit back in, in, and, 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 and discuss uh, 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 and make all kinds of deals, oblivious to the, 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 the little man, knows nothing about what is taking place. And the, the, the sacrifices are always made on their backs. And I am afraid, I, I, I hope I'm wrong that when the dust gets settled, a deal will be made on the backs of, of, of uh, uh, Maduro and his government, and uh, the, uh, the Russians and the Chinese will make it up in some other way. They'll, they'll, they'll make deals uh, uh, as to what is to be done. And this is what I'm afraid of. I'm, I, I keep asking and wondering why is it we cannot have an alternative economic system to what the West has, uh, is working with. It's a system that is used to, to beat down all these small nations that believe that they're independent. When I hear these small nations talk about their, their sovereignty and the independent, it's a joke because they, they fall under the purview of, of whoever imperial master wants to uh, uh, beat them down and, and take the resources. And so I am not hopeful for what is happening in Venezuela, but I, I, I hope uh, uh, that uh, somehow I will be proven wrong. I hope that the Russians and the Chinese and so forth can somehow decide and to say that this is it. We have draw the line here, and we're going to see, we're going to call the, the imperialist bluff and see where we go from there. But something needs to be done in the world. We can't continue to let uh, the, the, the U.S. And its, and its, and its lackeys the, those in Europe and so forth and Canada, I never expected that decision to come from the Trudeau, the son of the late uh, pre, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. I didn't have expected that from, 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 from this man. And so I, I, I don't know. I hope, as I said, that somehow the, first, uh, the other side will come together and say, this is it, enough is enough, and we're going to fight this evil force here I, and see where we go from there. But something has to be done. All right. Well, thank you so much. 
it's a very uh, tough pill you gave us to swallow here today, but mm -hmm. we'll have to wait and see how it goes. Thanks yeah. so much for your call today. Bill from Brooklyn, how do you see the developments? What do you make of this latest development? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Utrice and Hello. to the PR Hello. family. Yes, I'm, I'm quite troubled as, as Jose is, and it doesn't look good. And uh, it's not going to be the cakewalk that uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Pompeo, Pence, and, and their cohorts think it's going to be. Uh, the U.S. will never learn that it cannot continue to go into other nations for plunder and treasure, and, uh, and just that the people there will accept it. I think we're going to see uh, potentially a civil war happening uh, in Venezuela if, uh, you know, with the, 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 uh, the attempt to install this, uh, this little wannabe um, in, <laughs> interim president, as he calls himself. Uh, Maduro, like it or not, was elected as president. And as many have said, uh, this is uh, somewhat like uh, Nancy Pelosi saying, well, we don't like, you know, what uh, Donald Trump is doing, so I'm the interim president. It's unacceptable. Uh, I think the danger is that uh, the civil war that could happen there will become a regional war. And, uh, you know, with uh, other nations being pulled into it, and, and already uh, there are countries such as you know, Russia and, and even Israel and, uh, and China, you know, all these other nations that are inserting uh, themselves for their own uh, reasons into that uh, area. But the ultimate tragedy would be the people there, and uh, they are at risk. And it is, it's unfortunately a racialized kind of situation where the white oligarchs uh, that include the, the new interim president, that's want to come in and uh, basically uh, just uh, uh, rule uh, as uh, as they have in the past and also renationalize uh, the the oil uh, mm -hmm. reserves that, uh, that they have from your there. vantage point what would be perhaps a magic pardon the pun here but a magic bullet that would uh, work help things work out that will be complicated. It will require, I think, the, uni uh, the United Nations very assertively uh, stepping in and um, not so much to negotiate uh, Mr. Maduro out of power, but uh, to insert itself so that uh, it can be made clear that he is indeed the president of uh, Venezuela and that the people themselves there are the ones that should be involved in the restructuring of whatever government is uh, also, uh, unfortunately, I think there needs to be a, uh, you know, a rebalance of power in that region. I'm a U.S. citizen, an American. However, um, in this case, I think, uh, you know, countries such as Russia and China, uh, and all, the, all of this is, is theater in a sense. And, uh, and there are various operators that are playing their hand. And, uh, and, 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 for, and hopefully that hand won't go to the conflict. But uh, these other power nations do have a, a role to play, and I think they will play their hand, which could bring us uh, on uh, the cusp of some major uh, uh, catastrophes there. In the big picture of things, what do you say is at stake here? What is the most vital issue here? I would say that it is the complete transference of a of a war theater of operation, so to speak, that would be transported to Latin and South America. I think that's the big picture that we're looking at that people don't really realize. This could become a conflagration, and uh, and it's also driven by business interests. You know, the Raytheons and and the Martin Mariettas and the, you know, all these uh, military industrial complex corporations who are, uh, who are invested in, in war and the, the sales of their war machinery. Well, thank you. Very enlightening. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you. I hope I... Uh, yes, you did fine. <laughs> Very, I like, everybody is thinking, you see, and this is what excites me that people are putting pieces together and 
they may not have the same uh, uh, view, but they certainly have extraordinary insight and that we need to hear and appreciate. Bill from Brooklyn, you're on the air. Oh, sorry, I talked to Bill from Brooklyn. Yolana from New York, you're on the air. Yolana, okay, it's uh, not there. Yes, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. What I are your thoughts? Well I hope all is well. First of all, because Thank you're you. the captain of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I believe um, there's a systematic uh, system in the world that um, loaded with the superpower, especially the one percent that have been uh, running business for with NATO. The other one who destroyed Libya, which was like the Paris, the best country in the world. And uh, they just, the job is to just, they have so much money. They have all the wealth in the world. Uh, the, the sole purpose in this world is to just analyze which country has the most resources and go use NATO and not taxpayers' money to, for military to go and trade and steal these resources and drop bomb and destroy these countries and leave that, these countries into chaos, the same way they did with Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, Libya, Kuwait, all these countries, and they, um, that's what they did. They have a record. So they're doing the same thing. With, they did the same thing in Central America and South America and Haiti. So the system... What they are doing right now, they are using the media. And this is where the danger is. Because if most people knew about the, real, the reality of the politics of the world, people would rise up because it goes back into a pocket. Okay? So the thing is, when you have 95% of the media, CNN, MSNBC, even NPR, even Democracy Now!, that was brought by this 1%, that can mess up our mind, create confusion, and we are not getting the right news. Right now, right this moment in Australia, you have 49 degrees Celsius, which is 120 degrees Fahrenheit, where people are dying there and people are getting sick by the heat. Things are going, you know, with the weather. They own the weather. As a matter of fact, um, if you listen to the program right after you today, I think it's Global Alert News. The, uh, Dan Wigginton explained uh, the, one of the president, I think it's Eisenhower or, 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 or the other one, or Roosevelt, who said he who controls the weather will control the world. So if they don't get Maduro with the military that is going against him now, they will use the weather there. The same way they did the weather for Haiti, killing 200,000 people. And, and still 50,000 kids. So that's what they're going to do. They're using the media. The media is not telling us who Madoa is. But who Madoa is, is just a leader who wants good for his country. Not only wants good for his country, but he's spreading his wealth with all the other poor countries in the world. And the same thing with Chavez. Anytime you're a leader who's really helping your country, they will destroy you. They'll take you out because they are, you know, like if you look at Bolivia right now, you know, President Morales is really what a leader should be. Madora is really what a leader should be. But when you are that person, the United States and NATO country, they will destroy you, take you aside and steal the wealth. And who is going to be losing the people of Venezuela and all the other countries that Maduro used to help? So it's all about resources and stealing a livelihood from the poor people. And and we have to be very, and that's why we have, I always tell you that every time I call, I appreciate your show, I appreciate Progressive Radio Network, and we also make an effort to support everyone, even if we, can have, we cannot have a decision in what the government is doing, but we can push this radio station and support them economically so they can be there. Because if Progressive Radio Network is not there, it's total blackout. And, you know, it's, we have WBI, we have so, some small, but it's very dangerous time right now. We are in Agenda 21, and Venezuela is part of the agenda. And, and there are so many agendas that's going on right now. I'm sorry, you, you, I spoke too much. 
No, no, no. Uh, not at all. Not at all. The whole idea is to dollars, encourage you to speak. <laughs> to even encourage if you to speak. Because if it wasn't for Gary Noll, I'm extremely knowledgeable about health, nutrition, and I'm helping people recovering from cancer, ch- helping change, coaching them, changing the diet. If it wasn't for Gary Noll Radio, starting from WBAI, I used to listen to you, you cheese from WBAI. You are the best. You had the best program there on that radio. And I encourage everyone to push Progressive Radio Network. Every single program on this radio is good. And there's one Thank coming you after you. Thank you for too. that. Thank you for that. We need yes. as many uh, sources of encouragement to get the word out because it's a great way to get connected. We all can get connected. Thanks so much, Yolanda, for calling in and contributing so meaningfully You're today. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I just want to switch gears for a little bit and see what you're thinking about this subject. Defeated in his plan to build a wall along the 2,000 mile long southern border with Mexico, President Donald Trump plans to fund his pet $5.7 billion project by declaring it a national emergency. But yesterday, Pentagon officials testifying before the bipartisan House Armed Services Committee said there is no national emergency at the border. What's going on? (laughs) These are the people who are in charge of assessing all kinds of security threats to the United States and advising the president on what to do in preemptive fashion, they say there is no national emergency at the border. So how does Trump arrive at this conclusion that not only is there a national emergency about this wall, it has to be built now, he's got to get money now, and he's even threatening Shut down 2.0, another shutdown just to prove his point and to jam people up so that he gets his money for the wall. 888-874-4888. I'm interested. How is it that Pentagon officials, the, the, the people we historically have relied on as a nation to advise on security matters, national security matters. They're saying there is no national emergency. In other words, there is no need for all of this tra-la-la that the president is attempting to make. And the big, uh, the, the big fight that he's attempting to fight. There is no national emergency. That's their assessment. That's what they told Congress yesterday. So how do we end up with the exact opposite opinion from the president that he is going to declare, he's threatening to declare a national emergency on the very thing that the Pentagon says does not exist? 888-874-4888. JC from Westchester, tell us what you're thinking. Hey, Hey. Uh, I think to differ with you and everyone else. There is, in fact, there is, in fact, a national emergency, and it's located in the White House. (laughs) That that's the (laughs) national emergency. (laughs) That's where the emergency is. Yes, that's where the emergency is. That and the educational system in this country and all the other. The, the news people that that abandoned that that sold out that uh, that that don't even care about the Constitution anymore that have uh, that have just aban- uh, have betrayed our country. It's just uh, it's all about money. It's all about who who's going to like survive long enough. Uh, uh, you know, uh, by sucking up to, to the all the oligarchs or the. The, the the people that that 
the, the Bilderbergs, the bankers, these thieves that just continue to rob everyone. It's just we are at a, a, a run are on a runaway train, and, and uh, you know, I, it's just I don't think this. I don't think it. I think the time for talking is over. <laughs> That's what, what and if you don't know what happen, I'm talking about, I mean, then you have a what, what step should be taken when I the, can't say the that president's the own down Pentagon, and away. the Pentagon, which is you know the the government uh, that administers all these things having to do with national security and so forth. Historically, that's what their job has been, and they are saying the exact opposite and very emphatically. There is no national emergency, which is to say no so-called national emergency by Donald Trump should be declared. And if it is declared, we should consider it invalid. What do you think about that? I don't even understand that question. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's not, you know, come on, it's so obvious. The, the, the people that are saying there is no national emergency are the ones that are causing the national emergency. And it's not just nationally, it's worldwide. It's like we have, we have no qualms about going wherever we want and, and, and taking over. The rule of law is it just a joke. It's a complete but what, joke. Uh, but that's specific. You follow that's the, specific. Rule, the rule of law. All the people that are running this place would already be in jail. Come on. Let me ask you to specifically address this question. The president is hellbound on this question, that there is a national emergency which compels him to threaten even another shutdown uh, in order for him to get his $5.7 billion to build the wall. The president is saying that. Now, just yesterday, the officials from the Pentagon says, said there is no national emergency. What, therefore, how do you resolve these two divergent views? Well, first of all, you have to consider who's saying there is no national emergency. These are the same people that have lied us into conflicts, starting from, from the best of my knowledge, from Remember the Main, when, when we scuttled that thing and blamed it on, on the Spain so we could have a Spanish-American war. And that was, the reason that we did that was because that was right after, shortly after the Civil War. And the and the generals and the army that we had at that point in time looked at each other and said, "Damn, we got the toughest army in the world. Let's just go and do dragging whatever us we all want. the way back there." I'm asking, what is the position that Congress is supposed to take, uh, given the 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 total dichotomy of views here? The president saying one thing, and the Pentagon official saying completely the opposite. But thanks well, so much. It's simple. You, you, the con you, put the us, you put us on the, the uh, table, and we'll continue from there, picking up on your points. Thank you so much, JC. From South Carolina, Khalil, you're on the air. What do you make yeah, of this yeah. thing? Do they need to hire you and <laughs> find out what is the third way to see this? <laughs> I, you know, the, the whole thing is comical. I, it really is. And, and it's a shame that we've all gotten sucked up into this nonsense following this, this clown. And I hate to use these terms, but because let's start at the beginning with this wall nonsense. First of all, if it was that important, okay, the president had the House and the Senate for two years. If that was that important to them, they should have taken, taken care of it then. That's number one. Number two... Money was appropriated for border security, including what he wants for a wall that he has not yet spent. So let's, let's all keep that in mind. So he's asking for more money when he hasn't even spent money that's been appropriated. That's the second big point. And I'm getting to the answer, what you're asking. Now, the third, the third I'm, point. I'm following you. I'm following you. Okay. The third point. Now, 
you know, when, when there's a large construction project, the first thing you have to do is a feasibility study. You have, because this wall nonsense, there's, there's egress, there's right-of-way, there's uh, the land taking. There's a lot, a lot that goes into that. So this, the whole, this whole, this whole uh, exercise is asinine. It's out of order. You just don't give money. You say, here, have some money. Well, where are your plans? I don't have any plans. I just want the money. You, what, what is this? So, and I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be mature. It just gets me upset. This is just more nonsense. And it's a distraction. You see, he started this to distract from this investigation because he, he knows everyone around him is going to prison, including him, maybe. But, okay, so this is where we are now, and this is ridiculous. And, you know, he has hurt so many people over this nonsense. Can you imagine not getting paid for going on two months? Well, he can't because he's still getting paid. Ivanka is still getting paid. Her husband is still getting paid. His two sons are still getting paid. People in Congress are still getting paid. So what's the problem? Congress needs to do its job. And it, this is where we're. This is what's going to happen. This is what has to happen. Because Mitch McConnell has showed himself to be one of the most powerful people in, in Washington in the, in the last 10 years or 15 years. Uh, because this could have been solved by just allowing the floor to open. Now there's enough senators just to veto whatever the president wants to do. However, when that happens, his power will begin to erode. That will be the beginning of the end of his presidency, as if that's not already happening. Um, Is it interesting to you that to date, although the, the fight, of course, is about money and the urgency, the urgency for this wall, we haven't really seen any studies validating the president's point of view. All of this is hinged to his opinion and his thinking, but not to fact. Because there have already been uh, studies that indicate illegal entry into the United States is not occurring along the border so much as it is from airports. And people, people are even coming in by submarine into this country it, illegally. But it, it, the wall is not the principal port of entry for people coming into the United States illegally. But what he is doing and what he has a successful, uh, he has been successful at doing is conflating people coming from Central and South American countries in order to apply for refugee status. They're not, they're not illegal people. They have to produce documents. And now what he's hoping to do is to contain them in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, where there is the, a border point of entry. And uh, there are a couple board, uh, points of entry along the border, but these are people seeking refugee status. These are not illegal folks. These are people but with they're papers. Not interested. They're not interested in that, you treat, because at the end of the day, what this is really about, besides being a distraction because of his personal problems and legal problems, is that this is about keeping brown people out. And the sooner but we all can agree on that, the better off we all will be. Um, and the fact that that People just aren't being honest that there's that, that segment, that, that 33 to 40 percent of this population, they're scared to death of the browning of America. And there's nothing they can do about it. I mean, it's not, it's not other people's fault that uh, the women aren't seeking enough to make enough babies for their liking. Um, and, and as you said, the, the people are, are leaving the United States for Central America. Central Americans, I mean, the only people who are seeking refuge is because they're in danger. So the whole thing is made up. There is no, there is no crisis. And as you stated, most illegals overstay their visas. Um, so this, and we well, have to be honest. His, his mother was one. His his <laughs> grandfather was one. His aunt was one. When are people his going to come clean with this? And and look at Kirsten Nielsen. Now the man has already said he he prefers. Uh, Nordic Europeans. I mean, if you listen to his language, and, and that's the people around him. That's what they prefer. Kirsten Nielsen. Now he's, she's there because 
obviously, Nordic name, you know, get the Browns out. We want to get rid of those brown people. It's just so transparent and disgusting. And, and the fact that we have to deal with this nonsense, I, I just, I just, it, it's really, it's really pathetic. And, I, you know, and it's about money, too. Because remember, they, these people, these scoundrels, had a plan on how to detain the children. They, they started drawing up contracts for detention centers early on, knowing that they would be filled up. Uh, and the, the, uh, the unindicted, the, I'm sorry, the unconvicted, perjurous criminal, also known as Jeffrey Sessions, uh, Bogart Sessions, the, the former attorney general, he made it clear that it was a deterrent. They were going to separate these families as a deterrent. In the meantime, they, their, their buddies they have contracts with these uh, uh, for-profit detention facilities or prisons. So we have to look at that. And then we have to look at who's buying. If this, if this even a piece of a wall is going to happen, we have to look at who who's doing some land transfers along the border. We're you know who's buying up land. That's where you have to look. Follow the money, because this is not even a, this is just nonsense. Uh, and and let me soon, ask you, how yeah. in your view will this turn out? This battle over the five point seven billion for wall, where the president insists it's now a matter of national security, and his own Pentagon says nope, it's not. This will end up in the Supreme Court because uh, Nancy's not going to give in, nor should she. Uh, so Trump is going, to, the president is going to try to declare a national emergency, and there is no emergency, so it's going to have to go uh, to, to the Supreme Court. I don't know how they, I have no idea how they'll decide. I, I can only speculate. If they follow the law, it's not an emergency. Uh, well, the president, was, how will he uh, further damage his uh, relationship, and I'm using the word extremely loosely, loosely, with his own administration agencies. He's attacked the FBI. He wants to uh, attack the, the environmental protection agencies. He attacks his own agency and agencies and embarrasses them. This might be another one. Would he suffer any flack from this? He will not suffer any flack from his base because they hate brown people as much as he does, and that's who he's catering to. However, the sentient people, the people you know, uh, regular folk, uh, we we already have you know we have no confidence in him, and he's toxic to his to his cabinet at this point, and he's toxic to people who really run the country. So when I say that, what I mean is. He may not even be getting correct information from now from uh, the intelligence services because he's compromised, number one. We see that. You can't trust him. You can't trust him with any information. So what's going to happen? This is, gonna, this is just another um, point of degradation of, of his, his potency as president. Because if you can't believe your own, your own intelligence services, what's, what's, you know, he's not even really running the country. It's, it's Stephen Miller some people surrounded by him, and Mick Mulvaney, uh, you know, the Tea Partier. So I don't know and if I son in, the And his very capable and outstandingly brilliant son-in-law, Jared. <laughs> oh, it, did you hear that they are actually, people are actually tossing around Ivanka's name as the head of the World Bank? Oh, Yes. I did that about three weeks ago. They put her name into the hopper that she should be considered as a possible head, a new head of the World Bank. Well, well. Well, thank you so much, Khalil. I, uh, I thought that what you had to say was very interesting. And uh, hopefully we'll see in a short time where people are prepared to go on this? Where is Congress prepared to go uh, with respect to the, the president deciding that the, na the, the nation's treasury is his own piggy bank and he can stick his hand there and get whatever he wants out of it anytime he wants? But I guess there will be some resistance in the end. Thanks so much. Thank you all for calling in today and contributing so meaningfully to our discussions. I'm so proud of the level 
of discussion that you shared with us today. And we'll see each other tomorrow. Bye-bye. Very interesting program tomorrow. Don't miss it.